Hi there! Sometimes we design and build a circuit that needs a dual power supply, but in certain cases we really need just a positive voltage to power a circuit and a negative is only used for some special polarization that doesn't really need the same amount of power used for the positive. Consider, for example, a circuit with a MOSFET that needs a negative voltage just for the polarization of its gate. In such cases it is economically better to use a different approach than having a full-fledged dual power supply. This approach is called polarity inversion, resulting in a device that is able to convert the positive voltage of a power supply into a low current negative voltage that, in absolute value, is just a touch smaller than the positive one. Today we will explore how that can be done. However, before getting into the details, please take a moment to subscribe to this channel and consider becoming a patron, so I can continue making new and better videos for you to enjoy. Information is available in the description below. And now let's see what exactly is a polarity inverter and how it works. A polarity inverter is a circuit that is capable of taking a positive voltage with respect to ground and generating a negative voltage also with respect to ground, so that we can have both positive and negative voltage available at the same time to power another circuit without using a dual power supply. In principle, the inverter is based on the following circuit. There are two capacitors and two diodes, and a switch that connects the positive of the first capacitor alternatively to the positive voltage source and to the ground. When the switch is set toward the positive voltage, capacitor C1 starts charging through the first diode, which closes the circuit toward the ground. If we give enough time, not much really, the voltage of the capacitor increases up to the input voltage minus the voltage drop on the diode. For example, if the input voltage is 9 volts, the capacitor will charge to about uh, 8.4 volts. This is represented in the diagram by the first pulse on V in and the corresponding voltage on C1. Now, once the capacitor is charged, we move the switch toward ground. Doing so, we open the circuit that connects capacitor C1 to the input voltage and instead we connect the same end of the capacitor toward ground. However, doing so, the voltage of the capacitor C1 is now providing a forward polarization to the second diode, and therefore we have a closed circuit that goes from capacitor C1 to capacitor C2 and through the second diode. If we choose the two capacitors with the same capacitance, half of the charges on capacitor C1 will transfer to capacitor C2, and as a result, both capacitors C1 and C2 end up with half of the original charge, and therefore with half of the original voltage that was on C1. This is represented by the second part of the diagram, where now the input voltage is zero, but the capacitor C1 is at half the original voltage, while the other capacitor is also at half of the original voltage. On the next cycle we move the switch back toward the power supply, so capacitor C1 is again charged to the input voltage. In this cycle, however, the second diode is inversely polarized, so capacitor C2 is isolated and cannot either charge or discharge, thus it keeps the previous value of voltage. Moving the switch back to the ground, now C1 gives some more charge to C2, and therefore its voltage drops a bit, while C2 voltage instead increases a little bit more. And you can now see that if I keep switching back and forth, adding more cycles to the diagram, both C1 and C2 keep retaining more and more charges, and their voltage keep increasing, so that after a number of cycles, C2 has reached the same voltage as the input. But notice now, capacitor C2 is connected to the ground on its positive side, so the other end of the capacitor is offering the output a voltage that is negative with respect to the ground. If you look at the last of the four diagrams, in fact, you can see how the voltage becomes more and more negative with respect to the ground, with a tendency to reach the 8.4 volts we mentioned before. If we keep moving the switch back and forth at a relatively high frequency, we can quickly reach this state, and we can sustain it, even if we remove a little amount of charge from C2 at each cycle, due to a load that 
we could put across its leads. This circuit is called a charge pump because it is able to pump charges into the second capacitor even if it is not directly connected to the input voltage. Note that if we start applying a strong load to C2, the circuit won't be able to recharge it fast enough and its voltage will start dropping, and that is why we cannot use this polarity inverter for loads comparable to those that we can put directly on the original power supply. But how do we move the switch fast enough to obtain this functionality? Well, the trick is that we can use a solid state switch instead of a mechanical one. Let's see now how we can do that with a practical implementation of this circuit. And here it is, the circuit on the right side is exactly the same as the one in the previous schematic. However, on the left side, the mechanical switch has been replaced with a 555 timer. This 555 is set up as an unstable multivibrator with a duty cycle of close to 0.5. Pin 3 of the 555, which is the output pin, will therefore move alternatively from the voltage of the power supply to the ground, thus working as if it was that switch of the previous schematic. The oscillation frequency is provided provided by R1, R2 and C4, which I calculated to provide a frequency of about 30 kHz with a duty cycle very close to 0.5. You can take a look at my video on the 555 which I posted back in August 2019 to figure out how to do that. The link is coming up now on the upper right corner of this video. Besides the presence of the 555, this circuit works exactly the same as the Concept 1. Let's now take some measurements in lab to see how it performs in reality. So first let's take a look at a circuit which I built on a breadboard. This one is the 555 that acts as the switch of the inverter. These are the two capacitors that make the charge pump that creates the negative voltage at the output. These two headers are respectively the output and the ground, which is common with the input. And these are the capacitor and the two resistors that provide the timing for the oscillator. And finally these are the two diodes that control the charge and discharge of the pump's two capacitors. I'll power up the circuit using this power supply, which I have set for an output of 9 volts. The multimeter here will be used to measure the amount of current that will be taken from the output of the polarity inverter through this electronic load, which I described in a previous video. The electronic load is actually capable of measuring the current, as well as the voltage of the inverter output, however its ammeter was not meant to have a lot of sensitivity, and that's why I used the multimeter for that. The voltmeter on the electronic load instead will be enough to see any change in the output voltage of the inverter. So, let's start by connecting only the load to the inverter and then powering up the circuit. You can see that currently the voltmeter at the output measures 9 volts when there is no load. The current seems to currently to be zero, but let's make sure that is really so by connecting the multimeter working as an ammeter in series with the output. And in fact, the ammeter senses a mere 0.11 milliamps. A very low current indeed. Let's now increase the load and let's see what happened. Here, you can see that just with about 6 mA of load on the output, the output voltage drops to 6 volts, and with 4 mA we have about uh, 6.2 volts. So, we can clearly see that the output voltage decreases with the increase of the load, and in fact, if I increase the load to 42 mA, we have now an output of only 4.3 volts, and going up with the current as expected makes things even worse. We can definitely say that this basic circuit works fine only for very low loads around a value of single digits milliamps. Let's now take a look at how we can squeeze more current from a polarity inverter. In order to be able to support higher currents, we need to be able to recharge the capacitors at a faster pace, which translates in a higher current. We can do so by using the output of the 555 to pilot a couple of transistors with a high value of beta, which is the coefficient that expresses the amplification in current of the transistor. With a higher available current, the capacitors will charge faster, and therefore it will be possible to handle a higher load current. This circuit is basically identical to the previous one, but instead of applying the output voltage of the 555 directly to the charge pump, made of C1, C2, D1 and D2, the 555 controls the two transistors AD50 and 8550, which are an NPN and a PMP, respectively. With these transistors we can still connect the positive lead of C2 to the positive of the power supply and to the ground alternatively, and we can force the charges in and out of the two capacitors to move at faster pace. 
space. The two resistors are three and are four, are necessary to limit the amount of current through the base of the transistors. Too much current in there would have two unwanted effects. First, the transistors could burn because of too much current, and therefore too much heat. Second, even if the transistors did not burn, they would still go deep into saturation, which would make them spend more time moving between the on and off states. In addition to that, since the voltage of the output of the 555 does not change instantaneously between 0 and Vin, there will be a period during the transition where both transistors will be on at the same time. As a result, the input voltage will be short-circuited through the transistors for a little while during each cycle, and this is a condition that definitely we want to avoid. To fix the problem, I added these two Zener diodes to the circuit. The Zener diodes create a gap between 4.7 volts and 5.1 volts that will prevent the two transistors to be both on at the same time, and thus fixing the short circuit problem. Here is how it works exactly. During the transition from 0 to 9 volt on pin 3 of the 555, the transistor 8550 will be on in the interval between 0 and 4.7 volts. During the interval between 4.7 and 5. 1 volts, both transistors will be off because the Zeners will not allow anything to pass through. And finally, during the transition between 5.1 and 9 volts, the transistor 850 will be on. Vice versa, during the transition from 9 volts to 0, the opposite sequence will happen. First, the transistor 850 will be on, then both transistors will be off, and then the transistor 8550 will be on, alone. So, as you can see, the two Zener diodes will make sure that the two transistors will never be on at the same time, thus protecting them and the power supply. The final effect will be still the same, the positive lead of C2 will be alternatively connected to the positive and to the ground, making the charge pump to work and creating the negative output. Let's test this new circuit in lab. Here it is, with the two transistors connected to the output of the 555. The two transistors are the ones that will allow a stronger charging current into the two capacitors that make the charge pump. Since we can charge the capacitors faster, I decided to use a higher capacitance value, 100 microfarads instead of the 47 of the previous circuit, so I can have more charges available to produce current. These are the two Zener diodes that will prevent the transistors from being on at the same time, and these close to the capacitors are the two diodes that are part of the charge pump. And the section of the 555 oscillator is basically identical to the one of the previous circuit. Let's now connect the power supply, the multimeter and the electronic load to the new circuit. This will be exactly the same setup used for the previous basic circuit. You can see that with no load we still have a residual output current of about 0.11 milliamps. However, on the power supply side, you can see that there is a drain of about 16 milliamps caused by the circuit under test, and this is the price that we are paying for using such configuration with the two transistors. The fact is that even if we tried to prevent the transistors from being on at the same time, they can still partially conduce some little amount of current at the same time in each cycle, and that is the one that we are measuring on the ammeter of the power supply. A small current indeed, but it's still enough to cause a little bit of electric power waste. The voltage at the load is about 8.5 volts, which is expected given the drop of voltage of about 0.6 volts caused by each diode. And now, let's increase the load current. You see, now we are at about 17 milliamps, but the voltage is much higher than before, about 7.3 volts. Further increasing the current, the voltage keeps dropping, but now we can go to about 50 milliamps, and still the output voltage remains around 6.8 volts. If I now increase the voltage of the power supply, going to 12 volts, I will allow the transistors to work in a faster region of their characteristics, and so, when I apply a load, the drop of voltage relatively to the power supply voltage becomes even smaller, and thus the circuit works even better. You can see now how we can deal with a little load on the polarity inverter with no major issues, and that helps us to save in terms of avoiding costly dual power supplies when we need just a little current on one of the two poles. However, in the case we do need to draw more current, a dual power supply is still needed, as no one polarity inverter will ever be able to work beyond a certain amount of current that will always be smaller than the one that the actual power supply can offer on its output. 
And this, without even mentioning the fact that the two voltages, positive and negative, will never be able to be exactly the same. In conclusion, a polarity inverter presents some sort of usefulness in certain situations, but will never be able to replace a full-fledged dual power supply. So, when do we use one and when do we use the other? We will use the polarity inverter in those cases where only a little load is required on that specific pole, whereas the majority of the load would depend on the single power supply. Whenever we need a considerable and comparable amount of power on both the positive and the negative poles, we will need to use a dual power supply. And now, a big thank you for following this video up to the end. Please let me know through the comments if you found this tutorial useful and if you would like to see more of them. Once again, if you liked this video and the channel, please subscribe and consider becoming a patron. Links for donations are in the description below. I'll see you in the next video and in the meantime, happy experiments!